Um, thank you, everyone. So I'll just end the introduction by Adrian and Warren. Um, first of all, I'll, I'd like to say that uh, uh, today I'm speaking on the personal capacity. Uh, all views and thoughts are uh, also the uh, personal perspective and in no way representing the company which I'm working from. Uh. So um, brief introduction of myself. My uh, name is uh, Wong Tim Fan. I'm, a, I'm an architect by training. I uh, started uh, working in China in year 2002 as a junior architect and uh, I've been working on uh, uh, China projects, um, urban development projects ever since. Uh. Right, I've uh, lived in the two most um, fastest growing um, uh, cities and uh, regions in, in China, um, Shanghai and Shenzhen. Okay, I just remember I forgot to share my screen. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, prepare a simple PPT. Uh, okay, I hope everyone can see this. So, today's topic uh, it's uh, Chinese policies towards business during pandemic. And then I've uh, added a, a, a sub um, topic uh, reading between the lines. Actually, um, it's just a sharing of uh, how policies, um, especially the ones set in uh, national level, is affecting the uh, business world or the market in China, not only during the pandemic, but um, it is in this unique time that we can see a lot of its characteristics. It's very, very uh, obvious during these, these few years. So on top of that, I also want to uh, take this opportunity to uh, share some pointers and also hard lessons that I have learned over the years. Lah. So I hope, uh, hope that everyone here can, at the end of the day, have some takeaway. Right. Um, I once learned a technique from another great speaker, and he says that uh, during some of these talks, uh, when there's too much words and too much uh, information, people might forget. Uh, tend to forget what what has been shared. So he used uh, uh, pictures, big pictures to, to, to show. And if anyone would forget the details, at least you remember something visual to take away. So I'm using the same method. There's three uh, uh, pictures that I want to show today. And I hope that uh, with that, the, uh, the audience here can actually remember and have some takeaways. Lah. First is, uh, the first picture is to address today's topic, is uh, policies and why reading between the lines. The picture is an uh, iceberg and it represents um, how complex and, um, and uh, uh, intricate some of these um, issues are. And most often than not, uh, we are only seeing what is on the surface or above the surface, which most of the time is only a tip of the iceberg. Right. And the important thing is actually to see what lies beneath. So, first of all, I still like so the year that you buy that pen, I'm here for I remember. Someone's mic is on. Okay, thank you. So, as, as we all know, the China market is extremely complex. Not only complex, but it's a dynamic one. It's uh, always changing. And in recent years, um, this change has actually caused quite uh, drastic movements and changes in the market. So, this complexity actually rooted in the, not only in the vast uh, uh, geographical spread of, of China, China itself being such a uh, big country. It spreads over various, a few geographical regions with different climate. With, if not for the unification, it should have different time zones. Right? And in China, um, contrary to many, it's actually a very multicultural uh, uh, a country in the north, the south, east, west have different, although speaking the same language and uh, looking at the same uh, writing um, uh, practices, uh, the cultures, the living, political, uh, cultural background are quite different. If you study Chinese history, 
you know that it has been uh, it's made up of a, a very different uh, background and over thousands of years interwoven and inter uh, uh, affected uh, itself to today's complexity very very different from the rest uh, rest of the world but being Chinese uh, most Singaporeans do understand uh, this complexity la. and and then and, and therefore uh, the Singaporeans uh, do have an advantage in uh, maneuvering in the Chinese market and society. Uh, throughout today's sharing, I will keep comparing China and Singapore. Uh, please don't mind me if you think that it's repeating. So another important uh, differences that we have to see through and to understand is the different demographics. The made up of the population in certain cities, the coastal cities, the inland, the west, the north, the south. And also, most importantly, uh, the state of each, uh, each region's uh, economic growth. This has everything to do with its population, actually. So these still, again, are interwoven. And these are the key factors in uh, the key ingredients of the complexity that we see in the China market today. Uh. It's the people and the economic growth, where they are, where the status and its, its potential, uh, whether this city is uh, at the peak of its um, economic growth spurt or at the tail end or at a transition or is at the beginning of its um, pickup. So all this will actually uh, influence and uh, affect business decision throughout um, uh, whatever sectors you are in. Right? So this, is, this business decision making is never about a singular factor. But it's always multi-layered and multi-dimensional. Uh, not only in the physical form, but also culture and also time. Uh, in the, the timing of certain policies and certain business decisions, we keep tying these two together, um, can make or break a uh, uh, business. Uh. Okay, so uh, what you see in the mainstream media or you see in the uh, market is like, again, uh, like in the picture, it's always the tip of the iceberg. And to, uh, to avoid uh, titanic mistakes uh, of pitfalls, uh, it's really very important to see what lies beneath and what is on the other side of this iceberg as well. So where do we start? How, how do we start to begin to, to understand um, policies? Um, maybe I just give a broad background. Uh, first of all, we must uh, always remember this. Uh, uh, the Chinese market, the entire economic uh, environment is a very politically driven one. Uh, it's extremely uh, complex, but in the same time, it's actually very unique. It's very different from the normal Western doctrine where most current economic theories are based on. Um, so much so that the leadership, the Chinese central leadership has always uh, use this phrase, uh, they realize the fact that uh, although uh, they are socialists in the core, but it's economic reform since um, Deng Xiaoping announced it in, in, in 1978, um, they cannot remove themselves from the rest of the, of the global market, this economic, which is uh, primarily um, based on uh, Western democracy. So without um, succumbing to these Western uh, doctrines and without announcing themselves that there are no more socialists, they came out of this phase, uh, uh, it is primarily still very top-down, um, driven by very, very strong and stable uh, leadership. Uh, at this point, maybe it sounds very familiar to especially Singaporeans, because exactly this is how our founding fathers uh, started uh, nation building in the beginning with uh, what you call an iron fist of stabling uh, uh, economic status first, and then moving into economic growth and then culture, uh, 
uh, national safety and whatnot. So China has also moved in that direction since the uh, economic reform, 1978. So some might say that this is a very, um, uh, what do you call, du chai, a very uh, uh, local protected or local protectionism, uh, especially those that are very uh, influenced by Western economy and doctrines. Uh. But to answer to this, yes and no. Right? The, the end effect might be a very close market, which is which what the market is right now. China market is still primarily a very close market with a lot of sectors uh, very much uh, protecting uh, local development and uh, sometimes barring uh, for, uh, foreign uh, influence, but they always uh, uh, welcome foreign investment. This is, this is the unique part of it. So again, this is not new to Singaporeans. Um, Singaporeans call it differently. We call, we call ourselves very pragmatic people. Our policies are there. Our policies are fluid. Uh, anything that works, anything that is good, that works for us for that time, we will apply. And then we will move towards making it work, whether politically or with the help of the, the business leader and the business world. So um, some even say that the Chinese leadership, uh, Chinese government has openly uh, admitted or, or, or they would, I wouldn't say the, 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 the word admit, but they openly say that they are drawing parallels and they're learning from Singapore, uh, seeing uh, how successful Singapore has been uh, to the past uh, 40, 50 years. Okay, so, but we are, we adopted that, that, that policy and stance, uh, not out of choice, but if you, everyone remembers, we were actually kicked out of Malaysia and we were left with no resources. And therefore, it made us, uh, our failure, our tolerance to failure, absolutely zero. So for us, it's a very strategic, very careful, step-by-step -step progress. And no mistake to be made because we have not enough resources to waste on mistakes. So therefore, we, we have built and worked on uh, such a very pragmatic, very careful, and some say uh, very conservative um, um, pace in terms of uh, uh, entrepreneurship, um, uh, business decision making. Uh, this is our way of uh, uh, aiming for success. But the Chinese do it slightly differently. Now, um, from the early years of the reform, they first realized that um, they had to move the country and move the mass of its population out of poverty, um, keeping people um, healthy, uh, make people less hungry, uh, uh, give jobs to everyone. And then they pick, of course, they chose to, to reform their economy, starting from heavy industry, um, resource intensive industry, coal, iron, um, heavy industry. They started in the Dongbei uh, the <laughs> northeastern part of China, where today has been seen as a, a very backward area or less developed. Uh, it is like this for a reason, because they were the first to develop, sacrificing um, its, its um, quality in the environment, sacrificing its core resources, um, education level, um, social fabric of its society, of its population, to, to mine out literally, to dig out from the ground, literally fuel for economic growth, which is, it successfully um, transfer this so-called uh, resource and distribute it throughout China, especially in the south and coastal cities. So um, we started uh, 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 the reform in 78 and in 79, uh, special economic zones uh, have been set up, uh, most famous being Shenzhen. So they adopt this um, uh, and behind all this is actually a very socialist idea, the using of common goals. First, like I mentioned earlier, is to move people out of poverty, to start economic growth, 
based on a mass population, but this population is uh, lowly educated, not a uh, lack of resource, and uh, in a simple word, hungry. So how do we make this, uh, use these mass resources to, to, to fuel the industrial growth and economic growth? So I adopted uh, the primary uh, industry, starting from heavy industry, production, infrastructure, building railways, building roads, building cities, uh, providing raw material for, for external economies, shipping the uh, resources out to Japan, to Southeast Asia, to the West, and then through that, increase trade so they can have uh, uh, product, finished products, merchandise being brought into China. And then the next phase, with all the goods coming in, uh, they have to increase the buying power of the population, especially the at that time, there were no middle income. Everybody was low income. So the mass moved on. So uh, as you can see, uh, it's always built on common goals. Big, macro, very grand ideas. In the beginning of a uh, uh, very, very uh, typical of any uh, developing, developing uh, economy. But the, the unique thing about it, uh, the earlier part when we say about this, uh, uniqueness it's, it's methodology that is so different from the West which is based on an ideology about individual freedom about free trade free expression uh, the Chinese adopt a more unique uh, uh, method so so to speak like what they say seeking truth from facts and it's actually a very uh, scientific methodology of testing out ideas uh, and then experimenting with it in a small area, controlled environment, test it, change it. And then once they have achieved certain success, they repeat it again. Again, similar to what Singapore has done, but in such a fast country, um, they have the luxury of failure and a safety net. If this thing fails, they just shut it down, draw another circle somewhere and start another city. Is exactly what they did in, in Shenzhen. Shenzhen was nothing. It was called Bao An Xie, if, uh, if, if, if you all know. Today, Bao An itself is a, a region, a, a district in the western part of Shenzhen where the airport is. So, um, and the earlier pioneers were very open about learning from abroad. Shenzhen being there, literally a stone throw from Hong Kong, they have seen the success of Hong Kong under the leadership of the British colonial government, and they want to adopt some of these this, this ideals and, and, and methods. And also around that time, uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, uh, visited Singapore and exchanged ideas with Lee Kuan Yew. And uh, uh, of course, Lee Kuan Yew shared generously with the Chinese leadership. And later on, if we even more in that sharing of how Singapore have, have achieved what is achieved even then. So they adopted a similar idea of using uh, uh, this Jingji uh, Tertiary, special economic zone, bounded in a specific uh, uh, physical region, and then apply special uh, policies, um, incentives, special trade uh, incentive policies uh, to uh, to encourage at that time more international trade and then sharing and exchange of um, more of importing um, knowledge and know-how in the industry sectors. That was the beginning. They chose uh, Shenzhen itself. And then the famous uh, first G2G, Singapore and China uh, G2G uh, uh, project in Suzhou. Where, where actually the Kuan Yew picked the site. And then they started uh, SIP, Singapore Industrial Park. Also a special region bounded by a specific boundary, physically bound, physical boundary, and having its uh, special policies and even a, a, a specially set up uh, governing body right, for the 
pure purpose of economic growth. Again, here, the common goal is now set more, it's the same method, common goal, set the vision, and then uh, the trigger down effect and, 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 and to execute uh, earlier plans. So at this stage, because it's a more complex uh, question, it's not a simple uh, uh, question anymore. So more complex solutions, more multi-layered, uh, multi-faceted, uh, more tailor-made uh, solutions were needed. Therefore, the setting up of these special regions. This type of method has not changed uh, um, since until today. So, and then this, the, this, the tool that they use are actually using uh, uh, five-year master plans. Or your so in this five-year plans, the central government and the leadership will set, a, set the tone, uh, the, the, the tempo and the direction for, uh, for relative uh, no, to, to, to downstream policies and uh, uh, execution plans for the next five years, they're doing blocks of five. So it has been successful then, and it will still be, from what I see. So um, in the, the latest uh, fire plan is the 14th uh, fire plan, uh, started, started in 2020. So uh, next I will share you the this key directions and emphasis of this, uh, uh, the latest fire plan which has its, uh, in its core quality and sustainability. So uh, let me explain a little bit more on this, this, this core idea that is driving this 14 uh, five year plan. Um, in uh, the previous, the 13 five year plan that ended in 2019, it was announced that they have hit their KPI so-called, they have achieved their goal. Uh, what goal is this? is to urbanize 60% of the population. Because for the past uh, three decades, um, the earlier issues of moving the mass out of poverty to start an economy that is more uh, attached or more in line with the global economy to increase the gross domestic production, to increase every individual's uh, 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 spending power to increase the standard of living. All these were the main core goals. And then they achieve it through urbanization as a driving force. Moving the bulk of the population from a very rural uh, demographic to a very urban one that all lives in the city. Therefore, the massive investment and growth in infrastructure and urban development which gives rise to the boom time Charlie uh, of, 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 of this uh, uh, real estate uh, development over the past uh, three decades. And it has given birth to millions and millions of residential uh, units, developments, and trillions of dollars of profit from doing what they call Itzi Kaifa, Erzi Kaifa infrastructure uh, development and also uh, the real estate development. But from the look of it, it seems very uh, bling bling, seems very good. But if you study in depth and here reading in between the lines again, if you look at the um, major uh, real estate developers, which I'm in the line, uh, that's why I share it more. Um, after decades of growth, we realized that the makeup <clears throat> of these uh, uh, property developments are mainly sales and marketing people at its core. Very different from um, foreign uh, similar uh, firms where they have uh, expertise across different disciplines from design to management uh, to maintaining to marketing, investment, assets and all that. Uh, why? Because of the policies 
And like I said, it's very policy-driven market. With the strong um, support and very clear and very robust policies pushing this fast and mass, massive urbanization, there is no need for the uh, property developers to think of how to hold, a, hold on to a building as a holding asset to manage it properly so that its value will, uh, will appreciate over the years. All they need to do is get land, build, sell, and move on. Or what they call bumping coin. So this, this, this thing not only affects the uh, real estate uh, sector. In fact, if you look at the industry, manufacturing, um, transport, or whatnot, or services, it's all about that. It's all about quality, quantity, and speed. Whoever does the most in the shortest time with the cheapest cost wins. So this has gone on for uh, uh, many, many economic cycles. And it's making a lot of people rich. So therefore, there is also an inertia within the market to give this kind of uh, growth up. The past two uh, uh, leadership have seen double-digit uh, GDP growth, which is so tempting, and no one wanted to change this. No one wanted to shake the board, and then it has progressed. Well, we all know all good things, too much of any good thing will, will, will create a lot of uh, problems. And now, in the 14th, uh, five years ago, since they have announced that they have reached this uh, initial goal of urbanization, they are now moved into the next era, uh, the, the, the era of dumping Kai, the era of making quick money and using quality and, 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 and uh, economy of scale is over uh, from my personal perspective. Everything now, uh, starting from now, has quality and this sustainability tagged to it. The government now, the central government now, is uh, have seen from uh, global trends, how a unmanaged path of growth might end suddenly and create certain um, economic disasters situations. And what makes this even more pronounced was the uh, riots in Hong Kong a couple, couple of years ago. The, the, especially it affected uh, quite a bit in the southern region of, uh, of China, where the local government, provincial government, got a bit scared, really, right? Because they, they, they're famously known to follow the so-called Hong Kong model in terms of uh, city development, um, using private developers to, 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 to build, to fund public housing infrastructure and, and, and whatnot. But once the economy failed, because uh, private developers wouldn't have the common goal, uh, so, uh, to, so to speak, as a core value in their business. In the business world, profit comes first, always comes first. So in this so-called unique um, um, China, uh, this Chinese society, uh, like I always share with friends here, that everybody commonly says, uh, Ye ji versus zheng ji. It's always zheng ji first. And then you talk about your ye ji. But if you, hand, if you are handing over too many of these important um, execution part, although the, the direction and common goals and uh, the objectives are the same, but during this execution part for the past 30 years, they've handed over to the private sector. And they have seen and foreseen problems coming. So in this... Uh, 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 new uh, five-year plan are trying to shift big paradigm shift shifting this big boat and steering it in a different direction where the emphasis on quality instead of quantity and the, quant the quality not only stops at how it looks how good it is but how long it can sustain and how long it can be the best in the market, therefore sustainability. A lot of people think sustainability is only about the environment, but in this in the undercurrent is a is an economic sustainability that China is going for. 
if you look at uh, some of these industries that they are focusing right now on, uh, you will see this trend. Um, so, um, so at the at the undercurrent of this uh, sustainability is grand ideas of 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 uh, a common good again a common idea, but this time it's not restricted to only China, but at the, at the entire main. Mankind, so this community of shared future for mankind, the when they go to here, so very very grand words. So as I uh, come to this uh, in, in summary, uh, uh, when Warren first asked me what are the policies and how it will affect uh, foreign investments and uh, businesses in China, um, actually my answer to him that there's no right answer. It's always about reading and interpretation of each policy where it affects your business how it affects uh, your, your business decision making uh, in terms of where you're practicing your, your business, your region, which sector you are in, and what time. The dimension of time uh, uh, is also important. Whether these, these policies are long-term blanket policies or they are targeted, uh, result-oriented uh, uh, policies. Uh. So um, it's not just about reading uh, the, the, the uh, the official announcement of these policies, but also how different regions and how different local government and hierarchy has interpreted this and what are the outcome and execution sub-policies that applies. And then these are the ones that will affect the business decision even more. Right? So that goes on to my second uh, uh, picture that I want to share, this picture of the idea of hunting in a pack. This is more uh, driven towards Singaporean firms. So the era for everything that foreign is good um, back in a few decades ago in China is actually- We have five minutes, yeah, team. Sure, sure, sure. I have a very short, a uh, few more points to go. So okay. last time it used to be everything foreign is good to the local market. Anything that is done by a foreigner, everything that is imported is good. But this era again is over. Okay, and then due to globalization, there are more and more foreign firms uh, pitching their, their, their business in Singapore, I mean in China. And then also the next, the more important thing, the up and coming, the coming of age of local businesses and companies backed by a very, very strong uh, consortium of SOEs, the state-owned companies that are again backed by uh, the national treasury. So uh, specifically to Singaporean firms, uh, we are so small to start with. Um, it's high time we look at how do we collaborate. We could be competitors in Singapore, but in a vast market like China, we should really look into collaboration and winning, um, getting win win multiple wins is, and true collaboration. Uh, a, a good Example to learn from will be the Japanese, the Dutch, Koreans, what they have done. So we do have something unique to sell and to give to the China market, which is the Singaporean brand, which is based on integrity. Right? This is something that uh, I, I hold dear to, that I always speak to business partners and, and colleagues. Um, Singaporeans as a, as a group, as a community, should really hunt in the back and work together. So this is one of the more important takeaway I, I hope I can share with uh, audiences here today. And last picture, in this Chinese society and the market, it's always giving before taking. Uh, I see a lot of business leaders, a lot of uh, business owners make the <clears throat> mistake of always asking what is it for them first before they answer the question of their local partners, what you can give, what value you can give to the market and how do you work together to it? Because after all, although the China market is very expansive, it is still in the growing phase and it's still not reached its uh, uh, economic uh, target or objective yet. It is still developing in, in a lot of ways. So I hope these two points of hunting in the back and thinking of what you can give, what you can value at before uh, uh, looking at the profits or the taking uh, important point that I shared today, and I hope uh, everyone here has something to take away. Right, uh, Brian, thank you for reminding. I've come to the end of my sharing. 
I have to apologize that I have to rush for a flight. So if anyone have any question or want to contact me, you can actually go through Warren or list it down and, and send it to me. I'll try to get back to every question individually as, as soon as I can. All right, so thank you.